I told you if you have any questions about body language, just send them to me and I'll answer them. And you send them to me and I'm going to answer them. But if you have any questions about body language, just email them to me, bodylanguagequestions at gmail, and I'll get right on it. So let's get the first one. Is it true that being afraid of being disbelieved can make you act the same way as if you were lying? For the uneducated in behavior or body language, human behavior, yeah, you'll look like you you might be um, making something up or being deceptive. But someone who's a pro, they're going to know that. They're going to know what to look for. They're going to know what what you're doing. They'll see it. It's not going to last for that person. So if it's ever something that's important, don't worry about it. If it's someone at work or something like that, that's just the uneducated person saying, ah, you did this, so I know that you're lying or being deceptive. You know, it goes back to the classics. You broke eye contact or your single shoulder went up or you swallowed weird at the wrong time. No, there are things that show you you are scared or you're nervous. So you have to be able to differentiate those. And as you go through this, as you go through your study of human behavior and, and learn about body language, you, you'll pick up on those as well. So they look very similar. And they're really, uh, there are really a lot of them at the beginning, at the top, when they ask the question and you start answering. But the uneducated then again will take those first few seconds to go, oh, I, I know what's going on here. I know you're, don't worry about that. Because especially if you didn't do it, if you're not lying. A professional will be able to see that, so don't worry about it. I have a colleague who joined recently in our department. He speaks with eyes closed. What is that about? Well, quite often people think that's that person being smug, and that person may be, depending on what the question was and depending on what kind of person they are. There's a South Park episode where um, people buy a Prius. When they do, they talk about it like this. I got a Prius, and I did that, you know, so... It really doesn't mean a whole lot. Some people will read into it and think, oh, it means they're being deceptive or, or you know, it means something else. And they're a narcissist or whatever. I know a girl from high school that did that all the time. It's the sweetest thing in the world. But she just did that all the time. I think maybe she was nervous. And so when she'd look at you, she'd close her eyes. And when she'd look away, she'd talk and then look at you and close your eyes. When her, she wouldn't look at you, she'd have her eyes closed. But when she was talking to you, her eyes would be closed. Nothing wrong with her. To this day, love her to death, sweetest thing in the world. She wasn't full of it. She was just, that's one of the things she did. It's a little uh, habit when she talked. Still does it. What comedians do you consider the funniest because of their facial expressions and body language? There's a whole bunch of them. So I made a bunch of comedy records. Uh, that, that, and we sold a lot of them. So I, I met a lot of people through that. My brother's in the TV and movie business. He writes movies and TV shows and directs them. And I've met a lot of comedians through that. Plus, he was at Second City, which was used to be the dang, you know, that's where you grew them. That's where a lot, that's where they came from. All the people on Saturday Night Live came from there, most of them anyway. And all of his buddies were those people that um, he went to school with. So I've been around a whole lot of them. I liked funny in my whole life. But the ones I think they're really funny now that can, that can do that body language-wise, Kyle Dunnigan, you should go watch his stuff. I'm on his show sometimes. He's he's so funny. He's in a new movie that's just coming out called, um, um, I can't remember the name of it. It's about Pop-Tarts. You'll see it. You'll see it soon if it is not already when this comes out. Uh, and he's in that. But he plays uh, Johnny Carson and a couple other people in there. So, But you don't know it's him because they're using the AI to uh, mask him. You know, the what's it called? He uses that on his show. Does Sylvester Stallone and and all kinds of people and man, it's, he's even done me before and it's hilarious when I get on there and, and all just out of nowhere he starts putting my face on and doing me, it's so weird but it's it's really funny. Jay Okerson, Big Jay Okerson, I think he's funny. I think he's hilarious. His body language is perfect for what he does and his uh, humor. Um, my all time favorite though is Martin Short. To me, nobody's funnier than Martin Short. Funniest guy walking the earth is him and my brother. Mitch, funniest guys in the whole wide world, right there. So, all right. For a body language expert, is the movie watching experience impossible to enjoy? Are you always distracted by nonsensical body language on screen? I don't know why I get so many questions about movies and actors. I'm not in movies and I'm not an actor. Um, but for a body language expert, yeah. Um, 
it's not impossible to enjoy because you get lost in it. That's why you're watching a movie. You want that person to be doing the things they're doing, especially if they're the hero of the movie. So you want to be a tough guy. You know, you want Keanu Reeves to, to be able to shoot well and fight well and win and do all those things. So, um, no, I think, but the thing about that, sometimes speaking of people that use uh, weapons in their um, roles, man, he's done a lot of training. You can tell who else does that? Tom Cruise. Man, that guy's got his training down too. He and Keanu Reeves, they're so trained up in their use of, I'd say, weapons um, because it, it's real. What they're doing looks real. The way they're holding the guns, the way they're shooting, the way they, Pull them. All those things are real. They've they've rehearsed that. They've they've gone to training for that. You can see it on them. You know they have. So quite often when people in movies they'll they'll hold a gun, and it, and they'll they'll do this and they'll cup it in their hand like that. That's hilarious. And if there's supposed to be some big spy or something or some big famous tough guy and everybody knows it's tough and all that, and they do that, oof, that's or they call the the magazine in a. In a Weapon, they call it a clip. They're not clips, they're called magazines. That's the stuff that bothers me. If they don't look real and when they're executing something, they should be like a, a move or those types of things. You know, those are the only thing, the things that bug me, not the body language, usually watching them. When somebody is trying not, or if someone is laughing in a role in a movie and they're trying to laugh, and you can tell as an actor they're trying to laugh because mm. what, what they're supposed to be doing is trying not to laugh, right? When they're crying, they're supposed to be trying not to cry, not trying to cry. And you can see that. You'll be able to see it too. As the deeper you get into human behavior, you'll, you'll be able to see the expressions that are real and that are fake. Some of these people study those things up. I'm telling you, man, they're great at them. And um, some people don't. They just, they're familiar with the regular old uh, sad face that everybody makes, but they forget a lot of things to add to it because they haven't studied what r true grief looks like. So they don't, they haven't studied what, what they've looked at people being sad, I'm sure, but it doesn't look real. And that's why, because they don't know the intricacies of, um, facial expressions that show sadness or grief. Some of them do, and boy, they're good at it and they're famous. And they're, they're the top of the game of their game. So that's how you do it. What odds would you give yourself being intentionally deceptive um, to the other TBP hosts and not being detective? I do a show, another thing with uh, my buddies called the Behavior Panel. So if you're not familiar with that, that's what this person's talking about. And if do I feel confident that I can lie to them? Um, I think I can do it 100%. I think I can lie right to their faces and they'd never know it. Everybody feels that way in their lying, though. Keep that in mind. That's why they lie. They think they're going to get away with it. But I think I can look them right in the eye. I just lie my hand off. I didn't often when I think they believe me. I think, you know, of course, but they've got a pretty dang good baseline on, on me from years of the way I act and my behavior. But then I think, I know they know that. So here's what I would do to make sure. But as you do that, if it's out of, out of time at all, I think I could do it. Okay, I'm not going to go 100%. I'm going to go... 80%. I'm going to go 80%. Because it'd have to be something real. It couldn't be one of those things where you go, two truths and a lie. You know, those things, there's no, when you play that game, there's no stress behind the answer. You know, so they're not going to prison if they get caught. They're not going to lose millions of dollars if they get caught. They're not going to be in a whole lot of trouble if they get caught. So those 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 little games, I don't, I don't like those because they don't, they're not true to the emotion that should be felt when someone is lying because you have to lie for a reason, not just because it's a game. So I think I could, I, th I think I could probably get away with it if I moved on, if there were no questions after that, I think I'd get away with it. Yeah. And it may take them a little while to come back to it. Now that I think about it, they may not be able to nail me right then, but they have to go away, think about it, and kind of ease in a couple of questions and watch. That's what it would be. That's the way I'd do it. I wouldn't I wouldn't nail it down right then. I'd wait. I'd, and once I saw something weird, I'd back off. 
Then I'd come back a week later or two weeks later and just throw a little something in there that's similar to that question or something around it, see if they remember that they said that. Maybe wait a year, you know. I'm going to be around them for a while, so, yeah, I'd wait. That's what I'd do. Yeah. I know uh, sometimes I talk about Kafka, and how he said every man is necessarily the hero of his own imagination, or he must be the hero of his own imagination. Um, and it's, I, I mix it up with a guy named Brandon Sanderson who said every man must be the hero of his own story. He got that from Kafka. He's a big, uh, he's an author, but he writes like fantasy stuff. Those books where there's a guy on the front, you know, looks with long hair and wind blowing on him. And there's some woman hanging on him, you know, those kind of books. And I, romance novels, I think that's what it is he writes, but that's what he said once. I didn't, um, I don't read those. But somebody pointed that out to me. He said, you know where he got that? And I said, no, because I said, Kafka said this. And he said, you know who else said something similar? I was like, no, who? And they told me that. So that's where I got that. But um, going back to your question, I don't, you know, every everybody has to be the hero of their own story. So I'm going to have to say I think I could do it. Yeah, I think I think I can do it and get away with it. Uh, how can you signal in a conversation or a meeting with body language, with body language alone, that you should not interrupt or be interrupted? No, that's simple. When, as you start talking and you see somebody, you know, put their hand or something, put yours up and you hold your hand up and you look at him and you just keep talking. Uh, you know, for example, uh, ducks have webbed feet and they have these bills on them. But as they have these bills on them, they like to eat little bugs a lot of times. You can give them duck food. So you just kind of put your finger up or your hand up and not so it's big and embarrasses them. But, you know, it's like a hang on to it until I get finished. That kind of thing. We talked before about how you can get someone to pay attention to you. If you've got a lot to say and you don't want them to say anything, if you're one-on-one, -on -one, you get that ear pointed toward them, and you just keep talking, and you shake your head yes every now and then as you're, as you're giving them information. Because that, in other words, puts their brain on notice that the concept is their brain thinks they're the one talking, you're the one listening, because you look like you are. Because you're doing this, you may squint a little bit and shake your head yes. Because when you're listening to somebody, those are the things you should be doing to show them you're listening. When somebody's really into it, they'll squinch forward a little bit and get those eyes squinted and do that a little bit. Just do that as you're talking. That'll help a whole lot, especially if it's one-on-one. -on -one. In a meeting, though, you may have to, like, put your hand up, not like, stop, but, you know, put your hand up a little bit and give them the high sign that you'll be with them in a minute. How long does it take to learn the skill of reading body language? It can take you 15 minutes if you're not, if you listen to, you know, if you just Google it. And you're going to have bad information. You just throw it in, in, in the goo and go, hey, how can I tell if someone's lying? They always throw up these, the old things we, we know aren't true, the myths always come up because they're so popular, like the 738.55 rule. We talked about that as well. That's where, you know, it's, uh, communication is 7% of the words we use and 38% the tone of voice and the rest is body language, which is complete, completely not true. You know, and they'll say that, they'll say breaking eye contact. We know that's not true. If you break eye contact, you're, it doesn't mean someone's lying to you. It means you're thinking. You want them to break eye contact if you want them to be honest. Because if they don't, that's usually the person who is being dishonest because they know you think if they break eye contact, they know you think it means they're lying, which is totally untrue. But the person who keeps looking at you, their eyes may get a little bit wider as they're answering, and they may not blink a lot. Mm. Most of the time, that person's being deceptive, if it's a question about deception or whether they're being honest with you or not, or did they do that or not. So because their their brain wants to keep an eye on you to make sure you believe them, and that's why. So all those things will, will, will come up, but sometimes it takes, um, you know, you, we have a course you could take, man, that helps a lot. Uh, everybody takes that course and goes, I can't believe how much I learned going through this because everybody has a pretty good idea of what they think body language is. That's why not everybody studies or gets into it because they think they know. And most of the information they have is, is either wrong or it's incomplete. So it, it can take years. I've been doing this since I was a little kid, literally a little child, seven, eight years old when I first, six or seven, when I first got into this. 
So the deeper you go, you just learn more. You can get the basics. It doesn't take very long at all. Shooting 12 hours, 15 hours, you, you can have it. You know, you can, you'll have a, a good starting place, a good jumping off point. Because once you get information, you've got to apply it to what you do every day, make it work for what, what's happening in your life. So if you're looking for, if you're talking to your kids about where did you go? What have you been doing? Are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? Have you ever done this? Have you ever done that? You, it's it's a whole lot different than, than you asking somebody if they killed somebody, than you asking somebody if they robbed a liquor store or a bank. Big difference there. Big difference. But you you have to know what to look for. And just because you 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 know to look for a single shoulder shrug with a chin pointed toward it, just because you see that does not mean that's what's happening. It doesn't mean they're being deceptive. That's just a cue that suggests that. That's why when we talk about absolutes and how those things are hilarious and absolute, I always go to the nose scratch because I got such a big nose. People say, when you scratch your nose, that means you're lying. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Does not mean that at all. Not even a little bit. It means your nose itches, most likely, or you're nervous. So you might goof around with your nose a little bit. Some people goof around with their face or their ears or their hands or their ring. Totally normal behaviors for someone who's who's nervous and stress is added to that situation. But does it mean they're lying? No, go back to the first questions we were talking about on here. If you're nervous, you know, can well, people think you're lying even though you're 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 being honest? If you're nervous, sometimes they will, and that's why, because they haven't studied it enough. They don't understand the, the intricacies of watching behavior in real time and be able to make decisions about that. So are the right decisions. You can make decisions about anything, but making the correct decision about that, that's the key. You gotta be able to get in there and see what's happening, look at the situation, everything going on in the room or or outside what's happening near you in that environment, and you add that to what's going on with a person. That's why in interrogations, you have a little room with not much in it. It's a little table and you and the other person, or two of you and the other person, depending on what the situation is. So it's uh, it can take a while, you know. But again, just to get the basics of it, a little jumping off point doesn't take much time at all. Thank you. Go to bodylanguagetactics.com. Look at that. You'll see a couple of things on there where you go, oh, okay, I totally get it. I well, probably won't have much problem with it. But if, if you take the course, though, you go, oh, because it goes in depth on a lot of things, a lot, a lot of things we talk about on here. So you might like that. Go go take a look and watch a couple of those videos that that uh, where Greg and I are talking and explaining what's going on. But it's it can take a long time, depending on how much you nerd out on it. How how into it do you want to get? Because there's no stopping point. There's no, okay, I learned it all. Let's move ahead. As, for as long as I've been into human behavior, for as long as I've been doing the things I've been doing for so many years, I learn something every day. I see, like, I'll see a video where, where some person is new. I always watch those. I always watch those because they'll say something that, you know, when they go and start learning, they'll say something new has just come out that I may have missed. I'll be able to weed through the stuff I know is not true. But at the same time, they may say one thing, and I'll go, oh, what is that about? Then I'll go look up that person and see where they got that. And every book you get, they're going to have their references, where they got their information. So you can get one book, and and that'll lead you everywhere. It leads you down a dang rat hole, where a rabbit hole, where you'll learn so much if you're that into it. So learning to be, uh, learning the skill of reading body language is you can just use the very the simple light stuff. That's fine. A lot of people do that. It's what most people do. And there's nothing wrong with that. Not everybody wants to get into it and learn all the, the little things. They want to know if somebody's lying on TV, on a true crime show. They want to know if that did that person do it. They want to move on to the next one. Did that person do it? And once you start doing that, you shaking my finger at you, you'll start seeing these things that are that are that all these people have in common when they're being when they're lying. And you'll see those things in common where they're telling you the truth. They'll do some of the things that are similar, but there'll be other cues around those cues that show you, oh, you know what? And you'll get a gut feeling that says, I don't think they did it. Or I know they did it. This guy did it. Or this woman, she did it. So if you if, if all you want to do is learn about uh, true crime stuff, uh, going back, I'm not on here to sell courses, but we have a, a course called uh, the True Crime Workshop. Check that out. That's all that's about. 
is about true crime shows and how to you walk your it walks you through from the minute the cops get there, how people lie, what a lie is. Then we have a thing called the liar's loop, all the things that happen in the liar's loop. So you can, you'll know how when the uh, interrogator gets up in there and starts asking them questions, they don't realize they're going through this loop. We train that now. It's used all over the place. But uh, Greg and I came up with that. And that's that's it's key when it comes to training people how to uh, ask questions and in interrogations or at work, questions in, at work. Um, and that doesn't take very long to learn all those things at all. The key is knowing what else to ask when you start asking questions deeper I get into this answer. Um, but it, it, it could take years and years and years to learn about body things, to learn the specifics you want to learn. Just because you hear somebody spouting off about the neurological this and the, and this and the, and the, you know, the personality type of that, you don't need all that. You don't need all that. Don't worry about it. Unless that fascinates you. Then get up into that part of it. There are different little roads you can go down. Personally, I like all of them. But you can pick one road and do great. Just do fantastic. Learn all about personalities. Uh, dangerous personalities. Joe Navarro's got a book called Dangerous Personalities. Check that out. Then you add the skills you know about body language to that, and you go, holy smokes, that's how that builds. That's why it takes so long. You know, you can you can go into these, these gigs as a detective and start asking questions and just go on your gut feel and do that. And some people do okay in that. They do, but just okay. But until you start under, understanding how the brain works and how people work and how personalities, even though they're really different, there are types that are the same and they will act, you know, 90% of the time they'll do the same narcissists. They'll do the same thing all the time. That's why I, I told you before about my buddy who's, who married one. And when he married her, I said, dude, that's a narcissist. You got to watch yourself. I would not do this. Warned him. Still did it. And then years later, he's finding out, boy, it dawned on him, I think a few years into it. But some other things happened and they stayed together. But um, And I've known this guy a long time, from high school or junior high. I've known this guy. And boy, he stepped in it because he married one of those. But you can see those things, um, those things, those personality types, if you'll educate yourself on them and you'll be able to stay away from them or you'll be able to see one and go, ooh, I know what that is. I know why this person's having that problem. I don't, wouldn't say go in there and try to fix it for them ever. Don't do that. You can warn them. Say, I don't know about that person. That person's going to hate you for, for you telling them that. They're going to hate you for saying that you shouldn't marry that person or you shouldn't date that person. You can say, you know what, man? I don't know about that person. Just, just letting you know I'm not comfortable with that. You know, I like you too much and I'm letting you know I don't think that person is good for you. You can't say, there's a narcissist. You can't say anything like that. You got to be cool about it, you know. But you know how to do that. It's your friend. You'll be able to talk to him. So back to your question, um, how long does it take to learn the skill of reading body language? That's such a, a big answer or a big question with a huge answer. They can go on for hours, and I think I might. Um, since you asked me, I don't care. I'll sit here and talk about it all day. It's my favorite thing to do is talk about this. So, um, yeah, you, it could take a long time to start learning stuff, to start reading stuff. Make sure your information is valid, though. Make sure you get it from, you're not getting it from a hack, you know. Oh, Lord, there's so many of them out there. And there are not a whole lot of, of, of um, human behavior experts that are valid, you know, there really aren't. So check into that. Check into that. Look for some of these things I've told you about that those kind of people use. And, and the person who opens up with the 738-55 rule of communication, boy, that's the big one. Don't listen to that person. And it's not that they're lying to you. They're trying their best. They're gathering the information they think is correct, but they're not going deep enough. It's like learning about body language. The way I was telling to you a few minutes ago, if you're not really going to go that deep, that's fine. You can learn all you want. But these people learn stuff and don't go back and make sure they're updated. That's not good. You get, if you're going to be giving people that information, like in my case, if I'm giving people information that's wrong, I might get them killed, so I don't do that. I make sure every day that I'm on, I, I know exactly what's going on. If anything's come out new, I try to find out if we have any updated information on anything with behavior. It's so important. 
you know, people think it isn't, but it is. If you're training, it's really important. But personally, it could take it could take a little while to learn to go deep. But if you're just interested in body language as a hobby, man, it's a great one. It's fantastic because there's so much information. If you just read, after a while, that stuff will just start sticking to you. You say, why does that look familiar? Oh, so-and-so's book said this. Paul Ekman said this about that. I know what that is. I've always seen that. didn't know what it was. Now I do. And that guy's lying. Or he feels contempt toward me. Or she is disgusted with my hat. Or she doesn't like my haircut. Or she thinks my nose is too big. She's disgusted by how big my nose is. Those little children are making fun of my nose. Oh, I'm <laughs> I make a lot of big nose jokes because I've got a big nose. Um, yeah, so go, if you're going to do it, though, man, jump in. Jump in and, and learn all you can learn. I I love it. You will, too, I think. You probably do already. You wouldn't be here. Okay, when is the, when is the skill of understanding body language most useful? A lot of these questions are similar. For me, it, it's most useful in dealing with people every day. If I'm talking to somebody who did something they shouldn't have done or they're thought to have done something they shouldn't have done, um, that's when it's most useful to me because I need some information quick. You know, and by quick, I mean four to seven hours. So that's when it's most important to me. And then understanding if I meet somebody, are they full of it? Or do I believe them? Is this a con? You know, so that's when it's most useful for me. Let me know in the comments when it's most useful for you. When do you use body language? What have you learned? And where do you use it? How do you use it? And ask me a question in there too. You know, all right. Is language analysis more useful than body language analysis? Depends on what you're doing. There's a guy named Peter Hyatt. Go watch his stuff. What he does is he when somebody um, writes a letter or they'll um, make a speech, man, he can tear that apart and, and give you a lot of information about what's going on with that person, what might be happening with that case or that um, uh, situation. He's got that down, you know, and words, language is so much more important in communication than body language. You know, to give you an example, try playing charades. Play charades for 10 minutes. Then come back and tell me that body language is more powerful than the spoken word, understanding the spoken word compared to understanding body language. Nope, it isn't. When you talk, that's how we communicate. The body language part is extra. That comes along with it. That helps you, when you look at body language when someone's talking, that lets you know, or they'll give you the impression of whether or not that person is sincere. Are they who they say they are? Is this the kind of person you want to hang out with? So that's important. But language is the most important thing. Understanding what people are saying when they're talking. That's the most important thing. Don't, don't, don't let anybody tell you, oh, that's why it says, you know, most of communication is body language. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. No, it, go throughout the day and don't talk. Just use body language and try to find a bathroom. You can do a couple of things to let them know that you need the bathroom. But uh, try to get a cheeseburger with no onions on it. See what happens. Hmm? You got to go in. Can't go through the drive through You got to go in. You got to point. And then you got then then try. Don't use any words. Just body language and see what happens. You're going to be there a while. How do you deal with knowing someone is lying to you? Have you ever called someone on it or do you just file it away? Um, let's take interrogation out of it, right? Let's say I'm running somebody at a party or something, a party, like I'm going to parties at a social event, let's say. And um, for example, I shouldn't give you that example. Um, I will. So at this, uh, at Merritt Street, Me Merritt Street Media, you know, my, uh, my buddies and I got a TV show. Dr. Phil said, look, let's do a TV show and to make a long story short. And we're like, okay, well, that's what we'll do. And so as this, this network is launching, Merritt Street Media, 
we're meeting all kinds of people, tons of people, wrote just one after the other in groups and everything else. And we're trying to get to, to know everybody at the, at, in, you know, every part of the company. You have to get to know them. And you want to because it's people that are dealing with you. They're, what they're doing is as important as what you're doing because you're just one one little part of this of this machine that's running. So everybody, you have to know everybody and understand what they do because they already understand what you do. That's why they're there. But we don't know what's going on in that world. So we have to get, we get to meet all these people. Now, sometimes there'll be people with some of these people that um, we don't know very well at all. And they may not know them very well, but for some reason they're there too, you know? And so every time we'll meet somebody that we know is not part of that organization, then we start breaking them down. What do you think this guy's doing? Oh, okay. And we'll, we'll talk about everything from what they're wearing to how they walk and the words they use, their sentence structure, the, the thing, everything we talk about on here. Fascinating. One time, uh, I'll tell you this story. One time me and Chase were doing a uh, Dr. Phil show and there was, uh, I can't tell you exactly who it is because the people, because this is going to sound too mean. You'll know who it was. Um, one of the people wasn't a good person. And we were, had to go out and, and talk to him for a little while and then tell Dr. Phil what we thought on TV, on the air. And we watched them, both of them, and we knew exactly what was happening from about 40 feet away with these two people because they didn't know who we were. They had no idea we were going to be there. They would if they said, "Well, Scott Rouse and Chase Hughes are going to be," they wouldn't know who we were. We wouldn't have a clue in the world. And they could have said, "Oh, the milkman from when I was a kid is going to be here." Same thing. They wouldn't care. They wouldn't know who to look for. Which was great. So we're sitting down at the end of the hall and watching these two people. And I said, "Here's what I think's happening." He said, "Here's what I think's happening." And both of those things we thought were happening were happening because of the way they were talking to each other. So who was who was in charge? Was this person afraid of the other person? Were they really getting along? Who was pretending to get along with the other one? That kind of thing. Uh, is that person a controlling personality? Are we dealing with a narcissist? We can see all these things. These things were so big, even that far away. It was incredible. Couldn't couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. It was, um, it was fascinating. And we were right about them. So, but I, I wish I could give the names, but it's, it, it's mean. If I told you their names, it'd be too mean. Okay, if you're innocent and being interrogated by some sort of authority, is there a way to let the interrogator know that you're innocent? Yeah. Say, uh, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. <laughs> they all do. <laughs> um, if you're dealing with an, an interrogator, a real one, you don't have to worry about that. This sort of goes back to what we talked about earlier. They're going to know that you didn't do it. It may take a while. There are sometimes you'll run someone and you think right out of the gate, boy, this person didn't do that. And I know they didn't do it, but it, you have to keep going. You have to follow, follow the protocol to make sure they didn't do it. Depending on how important it is, it could take a long time. But don't worry about that. That's that's most of the time. I'd say most of the time because there's people that I train you. Know, Holy smokes, I can't believe you've been doing this for this long. But don't don't worry about that. After a while, they'll be able to see. When you go through interrogation, like I was saying, following that protocol, you have to keep going to make sure that they're innocent. You have to make sure they did it because they may be innocent. You may think they did it and they didn't. So you have to keep going. Even though you you may have made up your mind at the beginning, you said everything points toward that person doing it. it may not be them. You better make sure you're the you're the last line of defense there for that person's innocence. You have to make sure. And some people do false confessions. They say, I did it. You can't just go, oh, okay, great. Now, let's get out of here. I'm going to go eat. No, you can't do that. You got to make sure that they did it. It's because the other person's out there running around may do it again. And just so you know, I had hot chicken a few minutes ago. So that's why I'm burping a lot. <laughs> can't help it. I love that stuff. Do body language experts slash interrogators use Botox to help hide their facial expressions from someone they are interrogating? No, I've never met anybody who has. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to, you know, because sometimes you want to look like you're mad. Sometimes you want to look like you're surprised, even though you're not. You have to look interested. You have to use all your exp abilities to express expressions, because 
you, there's a message you want to get across too. You know, it's a, little, it's a little chess game you're playing. So you've got to have all those parts of your face working so you can show sadness when, they, when they're when they telling you something sad. And you can show anger if you're supposed to show anger or you need something from them from an emotional standpoint. I can't imagine ever using Botox for that. Plus, it's a neurotoxin. I'm not going to stick a neurotoxin in my face. Are you kidding me? A lot of people do it, don't have a problem with it. A lot of people do it, don't have a problem with it. I just couldn't do it. So that's a, that's unnerving. Would be to do that, get Botox, and then look in the mirror and not be able to you know, stand there talking like that. How are you doing? Great. How's it going? No, yeah, that's not me. I couldn't do that. And, and I don't know anybody that ever has. I don't see how that, I understand where you're coming from, but that wouldn't be a very good idea. That wouldn't be a very good idea. How do you teach people to be observant? Well, that's the main thing you're doing when it comes to body language. You're observing. So what you need to do, and we talked about it a minute ago, you have to, number one, look at the situation you're in, the environment. How is that affecting what's happening? Is there a snake in the room? Is there a dog running around? Is there a cat running around? Is it cold in there? Is it hot in there? What's happening? So how are those things affecting the body language you're seeing, the behavior you're seeing? Are they cold so they cross their arms? Are they hot so they keep doing this a lot? Or, or goof around their neck or their forehead. What are they doing? Is that room affecting them? Is that environment affecting that person? So you have to take into consideration everything that's happening in that situation in real time, not just their body language. You got to look at all of it as you observe their body language. So when it comes to observation, you want to, <clears throat> first thing you want to do, obviously, is get a baseline. A baseline is when you watch someone, you talk to them for a few minutes and Ask them how their day was, if they have eaten down at the whatever it is. Have you ever eaten sucker punch pickles? You know, anything like that. And they want you're talking about saying, get their mind completely off of, of what's happening. See how they act when they're not stressed yet, because you're getting ready to stress them if it's an interrogation. Um, but if it's not in normal everyday stuff, take everything into consideration. Where'd they just come from? Where are they going? Are they in a hurry? Did they tell you they're in a hurry? I'm late for whatever it is. What's going on? You got to take all those things in, into consideration as you observe this person's behavior. If you're just observing someone, you don't want them to know they're being observed, then you don't want them to know they're being observed. You have to be cool about that. Because if they know you're watching them, everything's going to change. It goes back to extra face, which we've talked about on here. People who are on, on camera and they know it, but they're supposed to be acting like they don't know it, you can spot them. As a beginner, it's difficult to read body language in real time and while in a conversation. What tips can you give me to that will help? Um, well, we just talked about that, really. Um, while you're talking to them, don't be looking them up and down and watching everything. It's really tough. You got to get that. You got to look at them and sort of keep those other other things in your peripheral vision and and keep an eye on that. And if they look away or something, you can look down, see what their shoes are doing, their hands are doing, see how heavily they're breathing. Those kind of things, but you got to be cool with that as well. So, but if you're if you're not real close, you can, you'll get a, a pretty you can get a pretty good read on them. And it's okay to kind of look around on them when you're at a distance. When you're up close, you can because that's going to get weird for both of you. So you got to be um, careful with that. But um, so those are the tips I would give you. Uh, hi, Scott. In in what capacity are you able to help your local police force? Well, I train them. But if let's, I, I think I know where you're going with this. If let's say, let, quite often the sheriff's department won't have, they don't have the funds to have uh, body language or behavior training or um, interrogation training. I got to do it for nothing. If I run into to a, an officer and we're talking, to, you know, we really would like to do that. We just we don't have the funds. I'm coming. Oh, I don't care. I'm coming anyway. Or if they'll call and say, we well, really don't have a whole lot of money to do whatever. So I'm to keep it. I'm coming down. Where are you? What time you want me there? I got two hours. I'll give it up for two hours. I'll go down there and, or an hour, whatever they want. And I'll talk to them and show them everything I can show them in that amount of time. Because they need it. They need it. Especially these days. So, yeah, if you're a uh, police department and you know, I'm near you and you, and you guys just need a little, one little brush up or you, you think it might help some, let me know. Email me. Email me. And uh, we'll connect. I'll, I'll come help you. I'll come help you for nothing. I'll do that. Especially if it's the sheriff's department. They 
a lot of times they don't have a lot of money for things like that. They're not poor or anything. They get everything paid for. Everything's fine. But if you don't have money for that, let me know. I'll help you. Yeah. Uh, do you think with all the information at our fingertips, those with personality disorders will adapt their baselines and behaviors so it is more difficult to identify tells? Um, you can do that. You can try that. And for a little while, it'll work. But you can't keep it up. You can't keep No matter what you know about body language or how much you know, you're not going to be able to keep that up. You may think you can, but you have, you have what's called cognitive dissonance. For example, if I said to you, I want you to keep a picture of a turtle in your head eating a sandwich. And the whole time I'm asking you questions, I want you to think about this turtle eating a sandwich because I'm going to ask you something about it. You have to have that picture. It's impossible. If I'm asking you whether you robbed something or not, whether you did something you shouldn't have done, you can't think about that and think about this turtle at the same time. And that's basically what you're doing is trying to pay attention to your entire body, to your body language, what you're transmitting. As I'm asking you questions and getting you stressed, you're going to forget about it. And these little things are going to come out. Your, your body language, there's no, there, you can hide it a little bit for a little while, but you can't get away with that. That doesn't last long at all. So it's not a good idea to try that. Having said earlier that I think I could fool the other guys on the behavior panel, I still think I could do it. I think I'm going to go to 75%. I'm 75% sure I could fool those guys um, because the question would just be one question and then it would it would go away. But then again, I know they'd come back and start asking questions around that later because that's what I'd do. I'd take a year maybe to find out. I'd find out. If I saw one of the little things that fired off to let me know someone right, or I got that feeling, I got feeling someone right. The same feeling you get when somebody tells you something, you see, and you walk away and you think, oh, okay, that's good. And then you go, why do I feel this way? Why does it feel a bit weird? Does it feel weird? And you'll ask the person, does that feel weird to you? Does that sound right to you? And then something's up. Doesn't mean they're lying to you. They may have something completely different on their mind. They may be sad about something or something may have just happened they didn't tell you about. Still, you want to find out about it. And that's that's the key is asking questions around that around the answer they give you and knowing what answers and what questions to ask. That's the important part. So don't don't be afraid when and I've talked about this this on here before. The, the key is not finding a lie. Yeah, you, know, you can spot a lie easy. Like I said, I can teach you how to do that in 20 minutes. You just spot all kinds of them. But you want to know why they're lying? That's the that's what you want. That's the holy grail, not just, ah, you, I'm never sad when somebody said, oh, I've caught somebody lying or I know they are, and they're like, ah, that's a lie, I know you're lying. That doesn't do anything, put that person on notice, and go, oof, that didn't work, and they'll come up with other things around it, and then they have a reason to be bent out of shape with you, so that screws up your whole body language thing there. So you're, you, you mess out from that point, you're missing out the real behaviors from then on, you know, so you gotta be, again, you gotta be real cool with all that stuff. As you go through for a little while, you'll be able to, to hide it, but not for long, not for long. The expressions you have fake won't stick that fake sad, that fake anger, that fake happiness. Those expressions don't stay very long. They start because your brain's not actually firing off that emotion. Ekman did some great studies on that. Check out Paul Ekman. I always say that get one of his books. You should do it. You should get into it. If you're not into it, jump in, man. The water's fine. I'm telling you, it's a lot you can learn in here. It'd be you'd have the best time. Just go get some books. Is there Joe Navarro, Paul Ekman? Go look at the greats. You know, start reading that stuff. The old stuff too. You love it. I'm telling you, you should check it out. Come on in. It's okay. You should do it. Oh, anyway. If you have any questions about body language, email me, bodylanguagequestions at gmail, and I'll answer them right here on this show. All right. <laughs>